Well, I'm here to broaden your minds. I'm not a, a physicist. Um, I've been very fascinated to hear the kinds of things that you're doing here. Um, and uh, I'm an evolutionary biologist, and uh, I hope that what I say will be of interest. It certainly ought to be, because evolution is, of course, why we all exist, why we are what we are. Uh, it's hard to think of anything uh, more uh, profound in some ways than that. Um, is evolution predictable? Uh, it's a controversial topic, and there have been people in... Can you hear me, by the way? Is, that, is this working? There have been people in my field who have tried to say that evolution is a kind of random walk, and, and I think that's clearly wrong, and I'm going to try to, to persuade you of that. Um, it's, it's not predictable in the sort of uh, rigorous sense in which a physicist would predict the result of an experiment. It's predictable in a rather more general way than that. W one way to look at the question of whether evolution is predictable is a thought experiment which was suggested by the theoretical biologist Stuart Kaufman uh, some years ago now. Um, he said, imagine that you could rerun evolution starting from some arbitrary starting point like the origin of life or the origin of the first eukaryotic cell or the origin of the mammals or something like that and ask the, the question, if you could rerun it a thousand times, how many times would you expect to get various possible outcomes? I mean, an extreme would be how many times would you expect to get um, an intelligent biped with hands and forward-looking eyes, that, that kind of thing. Um, and so that's going to be part of my theme, is, is, the, is trying to answer in an approximate kind of way that question, if you could rerun evolution in an experimental way, how many times would you expect to get uh, various outcomes? Well, if we go back not all that far, but if we go back to, say, the, um, the flowering of the mammals which took place after the dinosaurs went extinct. The dinosaurs went extinct really very recently, on only about 65 million years ago, uh, when some large object from outer space collided with, with Earth, almost certainly. And when that happened, there were, there were a vast open space waiting to be filled, and the mammals filled it. And they filled it and filled all the shoes that were left vacant by the dinosaurs. So the shoes left vacant by herbivores and carnivores and, and big herbivores and small herbivores and big carnivores and so on. Um, but what's interesting is that this was done separately in a number of different places, continents or islands, which were more or less isolated from each other. And I've listed there Madagascar, Australia, New Zealand, South America, and Africa. And the mammal experiment was, in a sense, run independently f about five times in different parts of the world, which were pretty much isolated from each other, because the great southern continent of Gondwana uh, was drifting apart by then. And each of the fragments of Gondwana, Australia, Africa, South America, and so on, carried with them their cargo of uh, proto-mammals, which were kind of small, shrew-like creatures. And in each of these places, independently, these small, shrew-like animals developed, evolved, flowered, and produced the, the great range of mammals that we see in those places. So in um, Australia, for example, um, that looks like a dog. It's not a dog. It's a marsupial. Uh, and it's a closer cousin to a kangaroo than it is to a dog. But it looks like a dog, behaves like a dog, actually went extinct in the 1930s, uh, behaves like a dog um, because it, it lived a dog-like uh, way of life. Um, so there we, we're starting to get an inkling that there's something predictable about evolution in that uh, in different places, if you start with shrew-like animals, you, you could perhaps predict that something a bit dog-like might evolve. Uh, there are, on the picture, three ways to make a mole. Uh, the one at the top right is the familiar mole that we know. Um, and by mole, I mean, in this case, a small burrowing animal that eats worms underground. Uh, on the left is, uh, is the Afrothea mole. This is an entirely independent evolution of the mole-like way of life. And this was the, the African version. 
And down the bottom is the Australian version, which again is a marsupial, a pouched mammal, which quite independently, so to speak, invented the mole way of life. They all look the same, behave the same, have the same way of life. And uh, so once again, we have an element of predictability creeping in here. You can predict that something like a mole is quite likely to evolve if you rerun evolution. There are two ways to make a flying squirrel. Uh, on the right is a true flying squirrel, a rodent. Flying squirrel, they don't really fly. They're squirrels which glide, so they have a membrane, a skin, um, stretched between the forelegs and the hind legs, with which they don't truly fly like a bat or a bird, but they glide great distances from tree to tree. And on the left, you see the marsupial equivalent. So once again, in Australia, uh, marsupials independently evolved the flying squirrel way of life. There are two ways there to make a saber tooth. They're both extinct, but you've probably heard of the so-called saber tooth tiger, uh, which is the one uh, on the right. No, sorry, the one on, on the left. Um, and that's a, that's a cat, uh, and it went extinct um, not that long ago, uh, quite, quite recently. Um, on the right is, again, the marsupial equivalent of the saber tooth. Uh, with the same fearsome um, giant uh, canine teeth. Um, uh, once again, uh, converged upon the same uh, way of life and the same anatomy. Once again, an element of predictability. That marsupial there, Thylacus smilus, is not an Australian animal. That's a South American animal. There were marsupials drifting on the island continent of South America, and so it was, it was uh, marsupials in South America that gave rise to the uh, marsupial equivalent of the saber-tooth. Uh, I think I'm right in saying there were no saber-tooth marsupials in Australia. Actually, there are more than just two ways to be a saber-tooth, because in addition to the true cat, which is the one on the right, and in addition to the marsupial, the South American marsupial on the left, um, there were other mammals that uh, evolved the saber-tooth way of life, and there's one in the middle. So at least three ways to make a saber-tooth. Sometimes the solution to the problem is not so similar. And the, um, uh, on the top of that picture, you see various kinds of kangaroo, which were the Australian, are indeed the Australian equivalent, marsupial equivalent, to antelopes, uh, cows, and, and deer, and things like that. Um, so what happened there was that when marsupials, marsupial mammals, stepped into the shoes of the herbivorous dinosaurs, in Australia, they did it in a different way. They, they, they evolved bipedal hopping, whereas in the rest of the world, they evolved quadrupedal galloping. And uh, this simply means there's, not a, there's no one correct solution to the problem of how to run fast as a herbivore. Uh, and the, you know, the Australian ones happened to, to go one way, while in the rest of the world uh, they, went, they went the other way. Before the dinosaurs, the dinosaurs themselves stepped into shoes which were left vacant by the so-called mammal-like reptiles by the ancestors, the ancestral type of mammals um, which, which populated the land before the dinosaurs came on the scene. And um, there you see a, uh, an evolutionary tree of the so-called mammal-like reptiles, which once again did all the various trades that the dinosaurs were later to do, carnivores and herbivores, big, big medium and small, uh, and, and, and so on. So we've reached a kind of interim answer to our question about the predictability of evolution. After a major catastrophic extinction, such as the extinction of the dinosaurs, we can't predict in detail exactly what will fill the vacuum, but we can predict the range of types 
that are likely to arise, herbivores and carnivores, grazers and browsers, meat eaters, fish eaters, insect eaters. There'll be runners, flyers, swimmers, climbers, burrowers. And the species won't be exactly the same as the ones we see today, um, or as the parallel ones that evolved in Australia or South America, or as the dinosaur equivalents or the mammal-like reptile equivalents. But if there were to be a mass extinction now, if, if another giant meteorite were to hit the Earth and extinguish us all, or almost all, um, we could predict that something like the range of types that we see today will appear again. They won't be in detail the same. If you want to speculate as to who would be likely to inherit the Earth, uh, my own speculation would be rats. Um, rats would boom because they would have a field day exploiting um, the, uh, what was left, all the rotting carcasses and things. Um, and I actually wrote a little sort of apocalyptic piece um, in one of my books, The Ancestor's Tale, which I'll, I'll read out. I have a post-Armageddon vision. When even the four horsemen are laid low by the apocalypse, it will be rats that scavenge their remains, rats that emerge as the ultimate post-human scavengers. They gnaw their way through New York, London, and Tokyo, digesting spilled larders, ghost supermarkets, and human corpses, and turning them into new generations of rats, whose racing populations explode out of the cities and into the countryside. In a period of intense competition, short generations conspire with radioactively enhanced mutation rates to boost rapid evolution. With human ships and planes gone, islands become islands again, with local populations isolated, save for occasional lucky raftings. Ideal conditions for evolutionary divergence. That's very important. You can't get evolutionary divergence unless you've got something equivalent to islands to separate off the populations that are beginning to diverge in evolution. If they're connected together, then sexual reproduction contaminates each other, and so they can't divide. So islands are vitally important for evolutionary divergence. Carry on reading from my Purple Passage. Within five million years, a whole range of new species replaced the ones we know. Herds of giant grazing rats are stalked by giant saber-toothed predatory rats. Given enough time, will a species of intelligent, cultivated rats emerge? Will rodent historians and scientists eventually organize careful archaeological gnaws through strata of our long compacted cities and reconstruct the peculiar and temporally tragic circumstances that gave rat kind its big break. Uh, a man called Dougal Dixon actually wrote a book um, predicting, I think it was called something like 50 million years hence or something like that. Uh, no, no, it's called After Man. And he's He's an artist, and he drew a whole lot of speculative um, pre-constructions, I suppose we could call them, of um, the likely animals that he thinks might be there in 50 million years' time. Of course, he hasn't the faintest idea what will be there, but he, he does a reasonable speculation based upon what we've seen in the past after mass extinctions. And he, too, uh, speculates that rats would play a big part in the radiation of new types, and there he's drawn a kind of walrus-like creature, which it would have evolved from ancestral rats. It's not that implausible, by the way, that rodents could be big, because um, in the past, in, again in South America, there were giant rodents, sort of giant guinea pigs. Um, the, the largest rodent today is the, is the capybara, um, which is about the size of a pig, or well, a, a sheep, I suppose. Um, a, a sort of a, Im, imagine a guinea pig the size of a sheep. They've got some in Burford uh, Wildlife Park. They're, they're worth going to look at. Um, but in uh, a, few, a few hundred thousand years ago, uh, there were giant rodents, giant guinea pigs the size of a small rhinoceros or a tapir. And there are pictures there next to a modern rhinoceros and a, and a, and a tapir. Okay, so that's one way in which we can um, tentatively answer the Kaufman thought experiment. What would happen if you rerun evolution? 
that way is looking at geographically separate places where the experiment has actually been accidentally rerun by luck. There's another way of doing it. We don't have to rely on geographical separation. We can think of the experiment of evolution being rerun not from the same starting point in different geographical regions, which is what I've been talking about so far, but from different starting points, very possibly in the same geographical region. For example, it's been calculated that the eye has evolved about 40 times or several dozen times independently in different parts of the animal kingdom. Uh, how do we know that? Well, we can draw the family tree of the major branches of life, the pedigree of the major branches of life, and we have plenty of evidence for what the family tree is like. And then we can fill in the family tree, which is all modern animals, remember. We can fill in the family tree uh, and draw in what their eyes look like. And, and if you see um, the, the distribution of eyes dotted around the tree of life, you can work out that different kinds of eyes have evolved in different places, and in some cases the same kinds of eyes have evolved more than once. And you can, you can count the number of times that from independent starting points, eyes have evolved, and it's several dozen times. So evidently an eye is a very good thing to have, so it's not surprising that eyes have evolved uh, many times in different parts of the animal kingdom using very different optical principles. So the camera principle, which is what our eyes use. And we know that um, the camera principle has evolved several times independently. Most glaringly, <coughs> if you compare the camera eyes of vertebrates with the camera eyes of mollusks, most well-developed in, in cephalopod mollusks and things like octopuses, because octopus eyes work in the same way as ours. They're a, they're a camera eye with a lens in front, a focusable lens, a retina at the back, uh, and a, a pupil that um, stops down. Uh, they have um, uh, very similar features, but there's one massive difference, which is that in the vertebrate eye, the, well, let's start with the, with the, with the octopus eye. The, the octopus eye is sensibly designed with the light-sensitive cells, the photocells, pointing towards the light, pointing towards the, where, the, where, the, where the light's coming from. But in our eyes, the photosensitive cells are pointing backwards. Clearly rotten design. Uh, and it has the consequence that um, the, 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 the wires connecting the photocells to the computer, which is the brain, have to pass over the surface of the, of the, of the retina, which they do. So imagine designing an, an, uh, an electronic uh, camera in which the wires connecting the photocells, instead of going out backwards, go out, go out forwards, and, and the light has to pass through this forest of wires before it hits the photocells. Well, that's interesting because it's clearly bad design, but it's also interesting because it shows that the, that the evolution of the camera eye was independent in those two groups. And by similar reasoning, you can show that, that um, the eyes evolved several dozen times. In addition to the camera eye, there are various different kinds of compound eye, which work an entirely different principle. Um, whereas the, the camera eye has a lens uh, which focuses an inverted image on the retina, an upside down image, just as a camera does. Um, a compound eye has, do we have a blackboard here? Um, a, 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 a compound eye is a sort of um, semicircle like that, and it's got tubes radiating out from a central point. And so each tube is seeing a different part of the world. And so if there's a, I don't know, a, an, an, an insect flying by there, then the head of the insect is seen by that tube, and the thorax is seen by that tube, and so on. So the, the brain can, can reconstruct what's going on by comparing uh, the, the information that's coming from the nerves from each of these tubes. And you can see that this is not an inverted image. This is, insofar as, it, as it's an image at all, it's the right way up. 
Whereas in a camera eye, where you've got a lens, um, then uh, the target, what, whatever it is, appears inverted because it's doing that. Um, and there are various different kinds of compound eye which work in somewhat different ways. Um, another, another optical principle which you could use to <coughs> form an image would be the uh, parabolic reflector. And there are indeed uh, mollusks, things like scallops, which have uh, parabolic reflector eyes. So the parabolic reflector is also, has also evolved. Um, so evolution is predictable again in that you can predict that if you could rerun the experiment, eyes would almost certainly evolve using actually all the optical principles that physicists have managed to think of, uh, of which there are about nine. Um, and so that's, that's an element of predictability. Um, you can do the same kind of count for sonar, for the use of sound echoes um, to find your way around in the dark, or where it's dark for other reasons, like um, underwater where it's very muddy. Um, the principle of sonar has been used by human technology, I think, since somewhere around the First World War. Um, and uh, it was then later discovered that bats do it extremely well. Uh, so, so well, in fact, that it's almost as though they can see. I mean, bats can, can fly in and out of wires, a sort of forest of wires. Bats can navigate their way through using, in, in total, total darkness, using nothing but um, echoes. And the, uh, the computations that are going on in the bat's brain have to be very, very sophisticated in order to, to do this, this accurate navigation and hunting for, uh, for insects on the wing as well. Um, since you're, I gather, you're probably mostly physicists, is that, is, is, is that right? Um, and you, you might be quite interested in some of the physical principles that are, that are, that are, that are used. For example, some species of bats uh, use the Doppler shift um, in order to uh, home in on, on insects, for, it, for instance, or, or indeed to, 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 to work out how fast they're, they're, they're approaching an obstacle like a, like a cliff. Um, and rather interestingly, one of the ways they seem to do it is instead of sending out uh, cries of a fixed pitch, a fixed frequency, and then measuring the Doppler shift of the, of the return echo, um, they, they seem to vary the pitch of their outgoing cry in order to stabilize the Doppler shifted uh, echo. And that's, that's an obviously a very computationally sophisticated thing to do. And it has the advantage that they can then keep the, 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 the much fainter sound of the echo close to the optimum um, for, for detecting it, because it's sometimes very faint. Um, bats have other problems, like um, which physicists might be interested in, like how to avoid deafening themselves with the loudness of their cries. Because once again, you've got this physical problem of the mismatch between the, uh, the loudness of, that must be the outgoing cry and the returning echo. Since the returning echo is very faint, um, in order to uh, overcome that, they have to shriek extremely loud. And if they shriek extremely loud, they're in danger of damaging their ears. And if, the, if they then reduce the sensitivity of the ears in order to avoid damaging them, then they can't hear the echoes. So there's a kind of problem there. And one of the ways they solve that problem is to um, temporarily deafen themselves while, the outgoing cry, while, while, while they're crying, while they're giving the outgoing cry. So they have muscles attached to the little bones that you know are in the middle ear that conduct the sound. So what the bat does is it pulls on the muscle uh, so that there's tension in the bone. That temporarily deafens the bat while the extremely loud shriek is being made and then it releases the muscle just in time to hear the returning very quiet echo. And since these cries are going out um, when, when um, doing the final approach to an insect target at something like 50 cries per second, that means that they're tugging on this little muscle uh, at 50 times a second in order to avoid deafening themselves um, uh, when, when doing the shrieking. So, 
it's a, it's a very, very sophisticated piece of engineering uh, going on there. Well, that's a bit of a digression, but the point is that this trick of using sonar has evolved four times at least independently. It's evolved in bats, possibly more than once in bats. It's evolved in toothed whales, that means mostly dolphins, uh, quite independently. And it's evolved in two separate families of birds, both of them living in caves, the, the cave swiftlets from which, which make the bird's nest soup, and there are similar but unrelated cave-dwelling birds in, in South America. So um, we have the same trick having evolved four times. That's much less often than eyes have evolved. So we might say that, uh, going back to the question of the predictability of evolution, eyes are highly predictable. Echolocation, sonar, is only somewhat predictable. Um, since dolphins use sonar, uh, we might speculate that ichthyosaurs, which were reptiles living in the time of the dinosaurs, they went extinct at the same time as the dinosaurs, they looked like dolphins and they presumably behaved like dolphins, so it's interesting to ask whether perhaps they were a fifth independent evolution of sonar. We don't know. Um, the fact that ichthyosaurs have very large eyes whereas dolphins have very small eyes, possibly suggests that ichthyosaurs were much more visual animals and possibly didn't, therefore, use echolocation. Like any zoologist, I can search my mental database of the animal kingdom and come up with estimated answers to the question of this form. How many times has X evolved independently. I've done it twice for you this afternoon, eyes and sonar, but we could do it for lots of other things, and for each of those X's, we can look around the animal kingdom and calculate how many times they've evolved independently. Is life eager to go down some evolutionary pathways? Clearly, it's eager to go down the pathway of making eyes. It makes eyes at the drop of a hat. It's more reluctant to go down other pathways like uh, sonar. How many times has hypodermic venom injection evolved? <coughs> stings. I've written down all the stings I can think of there. Jellyfish, spiders. By jellyfish, I include all celenterates, all sea anemones and things like that. Spiders, scorpions, centipedes, insects, snakes, lizards. Cartilaginous fish, shark-like fish, that stingrays that killed that wonderful Australian chap, um, the one who was on television. Do you remember? Um, Steve, Steve Irwin, that's right. Um, teleost fish, highly deadly sting in, in stonefish. Even mammals have stings, duck-billed platypuses, which are a wonderful relic of the early mammalian fauna of Gondwana. Um, male duck-billed platypuses have a hollow claw, a rather fearsome claw in the back foot which injects venom. It's a, it's a proper, it's a true sting. And even in plants, uh, stinging nettles. So what's that, about a dozen independent evolutions of the sting. Um, electrolocation, uh, another interesting principle. It's rather like echolocation in a way, but it doesn't use sound. Uh, it uses distortions of electric fields. So um, there are fish which navigate by uh, creating electric fields in the water. Um, and the interest of it is that it's evolved inter independently twice. And I put pictures of the, both the South American and the, and the African uh, versions of electric fish. Um, the technology of evolving electrolocation is quite difficult. Um, they, they, they produce an, an electric field, and they measure the distortions in the electric field, which are information bearing, by a, a number of little, well, voltmeters, I suppose you could call them, all the way down, down the side of the body. And by comparing the voltage in these different little voltmeters all the way down the side of the body, they can 
reconstruct the electric field and therefore um, calculate in the brain the distortions in the electric field which are caused by, by objects. Um, but in order for that to work, the fish can't afford to throw its body into the sinuous waves that a normal fish does when swimming because that would complicate the electric field so much that it couldn't be read, it couldn't be, the information bearing properties of it would be, uh, would be destroyed. So these fish have to maintain the body rigid and straight while they're swimming along, otherwise they couldn't navigate using electrolocation. And they do it in a very particular way which is kind of the same in these two different groups of fish which have independently evolved electrolocation the South American one, uh, the gymnotids, and the African gym <coughs> gymnarchids. What they do is instead of throwing the whole body into waves like any other fish, they just have one long fin which runs the whole length of the body. Uh, and it's this long fin, vertical fin, which is thrown into the waves, which in any other fish the whole body would be thrown into. But fascinatingly, in the New World gymnoted fish, the one long fin is on the ventral side, the belly side, whereas in the African gymnarchid fish, the one long fin goes down the dorsal side, down the back, which again is telling evidence that they've independently evolved it. They've hit upon the same solution, but with a very telling difference. In one case, it's the, down the front. In the other case, it's down the back. So electrolocation seems to have evolved twice. So it's a bit less eager, evolution is a bit less eager to go down that evolutionary route than it is to go down the sonar evolutionary route, but not much less, and quite a lot less eager than to go down the vision route. How many times has flight evolved? <coughs> True flight, not like the gliding that I showed you in the um, flying squirrels, but true flight that can stay up for an indefinite length of time rather than just gliding. Um, it seems to have evolved four times. First in insects, long, long ago. Then in pterosaurs, pterodactyls. And then in bats and birds. And each of those groups has independently evolved flight and uh, with all the um, technological hurdles that have to be overcome. Uh, in order to fly efficiently. And they've all done it independently in their own ways, coming up with the same solutions in some cases, different solutions in others. So evolution is, again, somewhat eager to evolve flight, but not as eager to evolve flight as it is to evolve uh, vision. And of course, you'll understand that when I use a word like eager, this is always metaphorical. In addition to true flight, uh, there are lots of examples of the evolution of gliding. And I've already mentioned the flying squirrels. You see one on the left in that picture. But there are also gliding lizards on the right of the picture. Um, there, there's, a, there, there's a snake that does the same thing, that launches itself from high trees, and it's got a kind of flattened body, and it kind of wiggles its way through the, through the air, um, falling all the time, but it's a controlled fall, uh, and it, it can go on for quite a long time. Um, the same with the lizards. There's a frog, which has its greatly enlarged webs between the fingers and toes, which enable it to, quote, fly, or at least glide, um, from, from tree to tree. And of course, there are flying fish, um, which um, zoom out of the water, probably when escaping from predators. And then they can glide for, oh, 100 yards or so. Um, before coming back into the water, uh, leaving their pursuer presumably bewildered. Squid do the same thing sometimes, um, and they achieve their speed by jet propulsion. Um, so we might then ask the question, how many times has jet propulsion evolved? Squid f swim backwards by squeezing water out of a spout um, <coughs> Uh, in, inside the, um, the, 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 the water is inside the sort of chamber of the body and it's squeezed out and they can swim extremely fast uh, doing that. 
Um, so jet propulsion has evolved in squid. It's also in a funny kind of way evolved in another group of mollusks, scallops. Um, it's really nothing like the way squids do it, but um, s scallops don't swim much, but you do s sometimes see them swimming. And um, they swim by clapping their two shells to, uh, up and down like a pair of castanets. And um, you might think that the way they would do it would be to go backwards like that. You'd think that's what it would. Actually, they go forwards. And the reason is that when they, when they clap the two shells together, water is squeezed out of two holes at the back. So like a plane, there are with, with two jet engines, the, these two holes at the back um, uh, s uh, have, have water squeezed out. And so the, the, um, the, the, the scallop swims forwards like that. Uh, what about things that have evolved only once or not at all? Um, the wheel, has the wheel evolved other than in human technology? Um, fascinatingly, the wheel seems to have needed to be invented and, and there's that wonderful story, which I think is probably true, that the South American civilizations, the pre-Columbian South American civilizations, um, did indeed invent the wheel, but only for children's toys. And they never seem to have generalized it to really useful transport purposes. Um, I think there's only one example of a true wheel in nature, and that's the, um, the bearing, the axle, of the bacterial flagellum. Uh, bacteria have, some bacteria have a flagellum, which is a long whip-like tail, and they wiggle that tail uh, in order to propel themselves along. Uh, the tail actually rotates, and it's som sometimes it's sort of rather corkscrew-like. And so um, if you're a bacterium that small, um, w water, w w you, you have problems with um, surface tension and things like that, and um, swimming through water is a bit like screwing yourself through a kind of jelly, I suppose. Um, and the, the tail, the flagellum, actually enters the wall. What you see there is the wall of the bacterium, and you see the flagellum going off to the left. Um, that's just the base of the flagellum, and it, it really does rotate. And it, it's a true axle. It really does go round and round and round. And what you're seeing there in the, embedded in the wall of the bacterium is a true little motor. It's a little motor um, uh, which goes r round and round. And so it, it, is, a, it is really a true, a true wheel. Um, so it seems to have evolved only once, apart from in human technology. Um, language, true language with syntactical, uh, with hierarchical syntax, seem to have evolved only once and that's in humans. Um, plenty of other animals use sound for communication, but they don't use recursive, self-embedded uh, structure as we do. By that I mean things like relative clauses, prepositional clauses. It's surprisingly hard, actually, to think of any good ideas that have only evolved once. And I went and talked to my colleague, the entomologist George McGavin, um, to see whether he could think, because he's a great naturalist, and I could see whether, want to see whether he could think of examples of good ideas that have only ever evolved once. And he came up with a little list, which I'll go through briefly. Uh, the bombardier beetle, genus Brachinus, seems to be unique in that it has a deterrent uh, or a, a punishment for predators uh, which is a hot explosion. Um, the bombardier beetle keeps in, in separate, they have to be separate glands, two chemicals which when mixed together um, explode with violent heat. And they shoot a jet of hot liquid out of the, uh, the beetle's rear end um, through a directed nozzle. Um, the ca this case is well known to creationists who love it because they think it's self-evidently impossible to evolve such a thing by 
gradual degrees because all the intermediate beetles would explode. Um, I, I, um, it, it's such a favorite example that, that when I did the Royal Institution Christmas lectures for children, I did a little demonstration. Um, I um, uh, got great big bottles of the two different chem chemicals. One was hydroquinone and the other was um, hydrogen peroxide. Um, and I said, um, well, now I'm going to mix these two, these two chemicals. And if anybody would like to leave the room, uh, they're welcome to do so. I then put on an old World War II helmet and sort of got down behind the bench and, and, and poured that and got, nothing happened at all. Um, and then I, I, I explained that there has to be a catalyst uh, and you can, by gradually increasing the dose of the catalyst, you can increase the strength of the reaction. And so we do in fact have a gradual um, uh, evolutionary staircase towards the final uh, adaptation. And I, and I demonstrated it by um, increasing the dose of the, of the catalyst. And the, f the final one, we did get a rather satisfactory whoosh up to the ceiling um, uh, when I added the two, the two chemicals together. Um, so the Bombardier beetle does seem to be an example of something that's only evolved once. Um, McGavin's next example is the archer fish, Toxotes, um, which seems to be unique in lurking just below the surface of the water, looking up and spotting an insect on a branch, on a bush, above the water, and then directing a finely aimed jet of water at the insect and knocking it off its perch uh, into the water, whereupon the, the fish eats it. McGavin's next candidate for an evolutionary one-off is the diving bell spider, Argyronita. Um, this, is a, this spider has returned to the water. It's one of many animals that, that comes from the land. Originally, its ancestors lived, I mean, all animals came from water originally, and then many of them came onto the land, and then quite a lot went back to the water, things like seals and whales and turtles, and some spiders, including the ancestors of Argyronita, but Argyronita, unlike whales and manatees and, um, and, t and turtles, um, takes its supply of air down with it. Unlike a whale, which has to come to the surface to breathe, Argyronita has a diving bell. It has a bubble of water, which it creates. And then it goes down in the bubble, underwater, and sits in the bubble, waiting for prey to come by. Uh, and every now and again, it has to go back. It's rather like taking a, a cylinder, of, a, a scuba diver taking a cylinder of, of, of air. Every now and again, it has to go back up to the surface to replenish its bubble, and then it goes down again. But George McGavin's champion example is a maggot. It's the larva of a horsefly, Tabanus. Lives in Africa, and it does a truly remarkable thing. Um, in Africa, predictably, um, pools of water in which the maggot uh, lives, it's, it's the larva of a fly, as, as I said, the pools of water dry out in the dry season. And um, what the maggot does then is to survive under the, under the mud. It burrows its way into the, into the mud and then waits for the next uh, rainy season. Um, and it... Um, burrows in a very, very special way. And it has to do this because if you burrow in the mud in Africa, as the mud dries out, it cracks. And you know, as if you see in, under drought conditions, um, the, the mud cracks as it dries and forms a kind of jigsaw pattern. And there's a grave risk for these maggots that one of these cracks will happen to cut right across the place where it's lurking under, under the mud. But if it could somehow engineer that, it, that the mud would never crack right across its little hidey hole, it would be all right. So what it does is before burrowing down into the mud and putting itself to bed there, what it does is it, it corkscrews, it, it, burrow, it digs a corkscrew-shaped hole in the mud going one way, and then it does another corkscrew-shaped hole going the other way. And then finally, it goes straight down the middle between these two um, spirals, 
Uh, now think what happens when a crack is moving across the mud. The crack moves across the mud and it comes across this cylindrical area which has been weakened by these corkscrew burrowings. And so the crack goes round the place where the, where the maggot is. So this is a wonderful example of um, apparent foresight uh, on the part of the maggot. Needless to say, there is no foresight <coughs> involved. This is all done by natural selection. Actually, I've just realized there's another example which McGavin didn't, didn't give me, which is somewhat similar. Um, it's a caterpillar, and I'm afraid I, I don't remember its name. It's a caterpillar which pupates inside a leaf, and it causes the leaf to wrap itself around the caterpillar, and it does so by partially biting through the little stem that attaches the leaf to the main stem. And because the, um, it, half the, the little uh, petiole, the little stem, is bitten through, um, the leaf dies, and as it dies, it curls its way around the caterpillar. So the caterpillar engineers its own, uh, it, it, it's a, its own home. Um, but imagine that it did that just as I've described it. Imagine a bird coming along looking for caterpillars. The bird would see that in all these perfectly good leaves, there was one leaf dangling there which was um, wrapped around, I mean, it was curled, curled up and dead. Well, if you were a bird, you'd go for that one. So what the caterpillar does is before it finally puts itself to bed inside this wrapped up leaf, it goes around biting its way through lots of other leaves. Um, to, um, so there's sort of safety in, in um, numbers of leaves that have been bitten through. Um, are there any good ideas that have never been involved? Well, as far as I know, um, no animal has ever evolved radio communication. There may be good physical reasons for that, but it, it's never happened. Um, fire seems to have evolved uh, by human technology. I mean, our ancestor, Homo erectus, or sometimes called Homo ergaster, um, seems to have developed fire. But um, I don't think you could say that any animal has evolved the capacity to make fire in the way that, say, electric eels use electricity. By the way, the, I told you about the weakly electric fish that use electric fields for navigation. There are other electric fish that use um, ele electric fields to um, stun their prey, much, much stronger ones. Um, I suppose to leave time for questions, aren't I? So sh maybe, I, maybe should I stop down and leave time for questions? Yeah, I, th I think I'll do, I'll do that. I will, I will thank you very much for your attention and invite questions. Thank you. This is more a comment than a question. As far as I know, mathematics has only been evolved once, but independently by many different humans, uh, isolated from each other. Yes, uh, mathematics has um, uh, only been evolved <coughs> by humans, but independently by different groups of humans. That's a very interesting case. Of course, um, explicit mathematics in terms of actually writing down symbols and formulae that, that's what we mean by mathematics, but uh, I need hardly add that, of course, animals are using mathematics all the time unconsciously. Um, when the archer fish is aiming its spit, aiming its water at a target, um, it must be, in, in some sense, doing calculations. It, its brain is, is I mean, we, we can write down the calculations that it must be doing, and in some sense, it's a very interesting sense, uh, its brain must be doing similar calculations. Sim and then when a bat catch, catches an insect, uh, and when almost any animal does anything, you could say that it's kind of using mathematics. But we're the only species, of course, that's developed um, formal mathematics written out on, on paper or papyrus or whatever. Hi. Um, yeah, I was interested about the, the importance of islands in developing uh, diverse uh, biological uh, pathways. Um, I was wondering if you could 
give us some thoughts about how that applies to ocean-borne life forms? Yes, okay. Um, the importance of islands, as I said, is that um, if it were not for <coughs> islands, if the, if the entire habitat of the animals you're talking about is absolutely uniform, then there's nothing to stop gene flow between different parts of the population. And so any putative um, divergence into two different species is constantly being swamped by mating between the two. And islands um, let, let that happen because uh, the thing about islands is that they're difficult to get to, but once you get there, then you can reproduce freely and there's only occasional risk of contamination from other islands. And so archipelagos like the Galapagos archipelago are famous cockpits of divergent evolution. Uh, the questioner um, asked, how can that happen in something like the sea where you don't have islands? By the way, the, 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 the word island, of course, doesn't just mean land surrounded by water. A lake is an island from the point of view of a fish. Um, a mountain top is an island from the point of view of um, a, a kind of animal that can only live at high altitude, um, surrounded by low altitude uh, areas that it can't survive in. in. In the sea, the equivalent of an island might be a reef, where um, it, which, ice, which is separated from other reefs. Uh, and so something like uh, the s many, many, many species of fish, which live only around coral reefs, um, uh, the, the distance that separates one reef from another would constitute the, the equivalent of the, of the island effect. Um, and uh, animals that live in um, uh, shallow water bays, for example, that would be another, another example. Uh, language, for example, has that only evolved with the ones, or would you say that... Language, yes. Um, l language has pretty definitely only evolved once. I think we can safely, and well, sorry, I don't know how many times it's evolved separately in, he, in humans. It might have evolved more than once in humans, but humans seem to be the only species that have evolved language. Um, there are precursors of language, which are the use of, of numerous um, different kinds of cries and songs and things, often very elaborate. Um, but as I said, they don't have <coughs> syntax. It's characteristic of human language that it has grammatical structure which is self-embedded, and by that I mean things like um, this is the something that did the something that did the something that something the house that Jack built. Now that's a, a series of sort of open brackets of relative clauses. The adjective noun of the adjective noun which adverbly, adverbly verbed in the noun of noun which verbed adverbly verbed. Now I think you can all tell because you're all linguistic animals that that was a grammatical sentence, never mind the fact that it was just nonsensical words. Just, But um, when, when you hear a sentence that, is, that opens a relative clause and then doesn't close the bracket again, you immediately know that's not a grammatical sentence. So if, if I say, the man with the red hat you want that to be finished. The man with the red hat who threw it in the air, you can see where the brackets come, brackets within brackets, and you want it to be finished by has gone to London or, or something of that sort. So the man with the red hat who threw it in the air has gone to London rounds the whole thing off. It, it appears that no other animal has that. It seems to have evolved only, only in humans. There is telling suggestive evidence that there are certain genes, maybe just one or two genes, which have mutated from our ape ancestors so that we are the only ones that have the mutant form. And that mutant form of the gene seems to be at least very important in language. The evidence for that is that there are some individual humans who are unfortunate enough to have, to have back mutated to the version of the gene which other apes have. So they don't have the human version of the gene, they have the, um, the chimpanzee version of the gene. And they can't talk, they can make noises and they can learn a few words, but they can't string sentences together. And so it's possible that the evolution of syntactic 
grammar um, was made possible by one or two very particular mutations. It's a remarkable case where you can actually pin down uh, or possibly pin down the, uh, the genetics of, of, what, of what happened. Some animal, non-human non animal communication is quite sophisticated. The most sophisticated might be the bee dance, where bees, highly social animals, can communicate to each other the direction and distance of food by means of a code. It's not a grammatical code. It's a sort of mathematical code. Um, and it is, I can tell you, you, you may already know about it, but um, perhaps you see if there's another question. Uh, thank you, Professor Dawkins, for a, a very interesting talk. I think it's been a long time since I've learned so much in one hour. Um, but I was interested by your approach, which I would describe as observational stroke interpretive. Um, it seems to me uh, there's an alternative approach, in, in fact, which is actually the one I was expecting, is where you would uh, start from a position of uh, understanding the drivers of evolution and then start from a certain set of uh, conditions and then go through the influencing factors to end up you know, with an answer to your question. And, and in fact, that approach, I would have thought, would end up, with well, your final <coughs> position would end up depending on your starting conditions. Yes. But I mean, is that uh, uh, not a valid approach? Or yes. is it one that's I mean, some is attempted? I, I presume you mean some, something that an experimentalist would wish to do. I mean, you'd actually want to, um, to manipulate uh, e evolution, do, do you mean? No, not necessarily an experimentalist. Um, somebody with a sort of sound theoretical um, understanding. I mean, that, that would be the, the approach that a physicist would take, for example. Um, well, I still haven't quite got the point then. If you don't mean well, experimental... Uh, uh, you, well, if you, you understand, if you know the drivers, if you know the various drivers of evolution and you have a set of starting conditions, and then uh, you, can, you can therefore say, well, these, these drivers are going to be favoured, these drivers are not oh, going to okay. be favoured, so, so they're going to take us in a certain direction. So yes. it basically says that where you end up depends on the starting conditions. Yes, yes. I mean, so I, ideally the, what the theoretical physicist would do, I suppose, would be not an experiment, but you know the starting conditions and you know the drivers, and so you, you can actually calculate um, what, what you'd expect the outcome to be. I think it's just too complicated for that. I mean, you can, what, what, what I've done is to do it in a sort of verbal way. Um, and ideally, it would be nice to do what you've suggested. Ideally, it would be nice to do experiments as well, by the way. Um, and the problem there, of course, is that it all takes rather longer than a human lifetime to do. Uh, that, well, there are a few exceptions. Uh, there are some, you can work on bacteria um, where, um, the, that where their lifetime is, is about, 20 minute, about 20 minutes. And so you can get, get a lot of evolution in, in a human lifetime. And, um, uh, no, but I, I, I take your point. I, I, I think that you, you perhaps under, underestimate the, the sheer number of variables which, Im, which impinge. Um, you, you gave a lovely example um, of the extinction, extinction of the dinosaurs for how evolution um, could lead to uh, a similar number of outcomes independently, um, which raises the in some ways, fairly obvious question, well, why didn't we get a whole load of different dinosaurs again? And presumably the answer is quite simply that, well, DNA would have evolved and the environment might be different also. So here's the question. What do you think is more important, uh, the environment in which the evolution is happening or the, uh, the, the, the DNA? Okay, that, that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, I don't know whether you could hear it, but um, the, que the question was, um, when, when, the, when the dinosaurs went extinct and the, the way was open for a whole new flowering of evolution to fill their shoes, why didn't new dinosaurs evolve? Um, why, was it, why was it mammals and why did they do it in somewhat different ways? Um, and the question is, how much of that is due to differences in the uh, environmental pressures and how much of it is due to the DNA, uh, as it were, the starting conditions? So the starting conditions for the dinosaurs um, at the beginning of the Triassic uh, per period um, would have been kind of lizard-like creatures that laid eggs uh, and um, were um, rather different from the starting conditions at the end of the Cretaceous when the mammals finally took over. So it's a, it's a strong presumption 
that, what, that one of the differences is that the starting conditions at the end of the Cretaceous were little shrew-like animals. They were already mammals, and they, they did mammal-like things. They had hair, uh, they had milk, uh, they had all the things that mammals have. So they were starting off different from the sort of proto lizardy types that started off the dinosaurs. Um, but nobody really knows, nobody can really answer your question how much of it was that difference and how much of it was that conditions um, were different after the Cretaceous extinction rather than the beginning of the Triassic. Um, it, it would be possible to speculate about that, but, but, but I, I, I think my answer would be the sort of rather evasive one that they're probably both very important. But from the genetics point of view, what is the implication, what are the implications of the fact that uh, the same features appeared in different species independently? Right. What does it mean? Does it mean that there is a common mechanism or a proto-genes yeah. uh, which are common, common to the different yes. species? That, that, that too is a very interesting question. Um, the question is when you get um, similar evolution in different, uh, in different groups of animals, which, I've been, which is largely what I've been talking about, um, are the similarities due to uh, similar mechanisms in the, in the bodies, or are they due to um, just purely independent dis rediscovery of the same um, technical solutions to problems? Uh, if you'd asked me that um, several decades ago, I would have been heavily biased in favor of the second of the two. I'd have said it's entirely independent um, evolution, entirely independent. Um, similar problems uh, are solved by similar solutions. And so um, when, say, um, octopuses evolve eyes and, and vertebrates evolved eyes, it was just a totally independent evolution of the camera eye principle. However, um, more recent evidence on embryology, actually how em embryos develop from genes, suggests that there are very surprising similarities right the way across the animal kingdom. For example, just to take eyes, since we're talking about eyes, um, there are genes which are recognizably the same gene right the way across the animal kingdom recognizably the same genes in that literally the, the sequence of DNA letters is not identical, but it's sufficiently similar that you can tell that it must come from a, a shared ancestor, very, very, very ancient shared ancestor. And I think I'm right in saying that all animals have this particular gene, and it goes under different names, but all animals have this, this particular gene, recognizably the same gene, and it always, when it does anything, it tends to make eyes. But the eyes that it makes work on very different optical principles. So experimentally, for example, people have taken this gene from a mouse and put it into a developing fruit fly. So if you take the eye gene, the gene that makes eyes, <coughs> when it's in a mouse, it tells the, mouse's em the mouse embryo to develop an eye here. But if you put that gene into a fruit fly, say into the elbow of the fruit fly, that very same mouse gene tells the, el the elbow of the fruit fly develop an eye here, and it does. But the eye that it develops is not a mouse eye, it's a fruit fly eye. So a mouse gene causes a fruit fly to grow an eye in its elbow or its knee or wherever, wherever you happen to, to, to put it. So, and there's, there's other even more striking evidence that there are genes which are not only shared across all animals or, or across such widely different animals as vertebrates and insects, but that those genes do something similar in those different, in those different animals. So the pendulum has swung a bit in the direction of, su of suggesting that it, there may be commonalities of the genetic substrate which uh, cause similar things to develop, but in very different ways in detail. And if we're talking engineering principles, as in eyes, using very different engineering principles. Would you be able to predict intelligent oh, life? Ca can you predict intelligent life? If we're, we're talking about uh, the predictability of evolution, 
um, how many times has intelligence, well intelligence of course can be measured in all sorts of different ways and many different um, animals are, um, in, are intelligent in, in various sorts of ways um, and so there are some very beautiful experiments on intelligence in birds, intelligence in mammals, intelligence in octopuses. Um, but if you mean the sort of highly developed cultural and technological intelligence that, uh, that humans have, there are all sorts of respects in which humans are unique. And uh, if we were wiped out, then who can say um, t something like a technological in in intelligence might evolve again. And I, my purple passage that I read out to you suggested that uh, future descendants of rats might do that. Um, it's taken a very long time for any animal to produce technological intelligence on this planet. Um, it, it's taken about four billion years. Um, so it's a pretty good bet that it might very well not happen again. If you think universally about other islands of life that might have arisen elsewhere in the universe, then um, we again have no direct evidence for intelligent life elsewhere. If we ever do encounter life elsewhere, it probably will be intelligent life because it will need to be sufficiently intelligent to have developed radio technology because that's the only realistic way in which we'd ever uh, encounter them. We're very unlikely to encounter them bodily, unless they're within our own solar system, which seems unlikely. Um, so um, my speculative conjecture would be that, that there probably is intelligent life elsewhere in the universe, but, the, but the, the argument in favor of that is based upon the enormous number of planets, the enormous size of the universe, um, and so these islands of life uh, seem likely to be so spaced out, if there may be a billion separate islands of intelligent life dotted around the universe, but a billion is a tiny number uh, compared to the number of, of planets that there are, and the distances between them. So it's a rather sad conclusion one can come to that these islands of life are very unlikely ever to encounter one another. Um, my question is, is related. Uh, clearly you do believe there is some degree of predictability to evolution. So the obvious extension of that is, is where might evolution go from here, particularly in humans? Um, and do you think that humans have developed to manipulate their environment to such an extent that they're effectively suppressing further yes. evolution? Um, well, if, if you look at the pattern of the pedigree of life from the past, um, it's a great branching tree, and almost all the branches that have ever come into existence have gone extinct without leaving any descendants. Um, at any particular time, the species that survive are descended from a small minority of the species that were alive um, some time in the past. So on that sort of statistical basis, you, one would predict that um, given that, that in 10 million years time, humans, won't, humans will be extinct without any, uh, any descendants. Um, however, because of human technology, you might say all bets are off because um, uh, whereas <coughs> all the mechanisms of extinction that have operated in the past, we might be able to overcome. Possibly even, um, at some future time, human technology might be able to spot an approaching large asteroid and head it off in some way. We couldn't do it now. Um, you, this, this can be statistically, can, you can expect this to happen once every few tens of millions of years. Um, so. Um, we, we've got a bit of time probably. We, it could happen now, this very instant. Um, but um, um, statistically, we've probably got time to develop the technology to, to spot a dangerous collision approaching and um, with, with, a, with a future technology, I don't know, send up rockets with hydrogen bombs on board or something to break it up. Um, uh, if we do survive for tens of millions of years, would you expect our descendants to be very different from us? Would you expect them to evolve? Um, and if so, in what direction? Well, uh, one way to answer that might be to look at the trends from the relatively recent past. So if we go back, say, 
three million years, which is still pretty recent by evolutionary standards, um, our ancestors at that time were probably of the genus Australopithecus. They were uh, bipedal, they walked on two legs, but they had brains about the size of a chimpanzee. So they were two-legged chimpanzees, uh, sort of. And the dominant evolutionary trend during the past three million years has been an increase in brain size, a really dramatic increase in brain size. So you might think that's a kind of trajectory which is, which would, maybe that's continuing into the future. But remember that in order for that to be true, it, there's no momentum, there's no built-in inertia in evolution. It depends entirely on natural selection, choosing certain types of <coughs> individuals possessed of certain genes for breeding and others for not breeding, often by um, some dying more often than others. Our ancestors, since the time of Australopithecus, must have gone through a period when the brainiest individuals were the most likely to survive or the most likely to reproduce. Um, and it, to answer part of your question, um, we don't seem to be in that evolutionary pressure now. There doesn't seem to be any tendency for the brainiest individuals to be the most likely to reproduce. Um, so whatever it was that propelled our evolution in the direction of large brains in the past doesn't seem to be working now. Um, it could even be that the least brainy individuals are the most likely to reproduce. Um, but in any case, remember that uh, any trends that you might think you detect in today's civilization have got to be continuously applied for a very long time in order to give rise to a, an evolutionary trend. Um, so uh, it's not enough to look around the world today and say what kinds of individuals, genetically di uh, differentiated individuals, are doing the most reproduction at the moment because that's unlikely to be, tr to be the same types that are in as short a time as, as one century, let alone a million years. Um, there are doubtless many people uh, uh, in, the, in our civilization today who owe their existence to their parents' incompetence in the use of contraception. And so if there's any genetic variation in incompetence, um, then, strictly speaking, we have a, an evolutionary trend towards incompetence. Um, <laughs> but that, that will only give rise to a, a detectable evolutionary trend if whatever it takes to be incompetent in the use of contraception today is still what it takes to be incompetent in the use of contraception in, say, 100,000 years' time. And technology will have changed so much in 100,000 years that the nature of what it takes to be incompetent, which is the Darwinian, Darwinian um, fittest um, uh, phenotype, um, will, have, will, will, will have changed. And so it's extremely difficult to predict what will happen in human evolution. If we send out colonists to colonize space stations or other planets, as some people in a science fiction sort of way speculate, then that would be rather like a, a sort of celestial Galapagos where, where there's rather little gene flow between islands of colonization. And there, there might well be the opportunity for divergent <coughs> evolution. And if we colonize a planet with, say, a weaker gravitational field than we have here or a stronger gravitational field than we have here, then you could actually predict uh, certain changes in the skeleton um, where a, it, if a planet with a strong gravitational field, we would, we would have great stumpy rhinoceros-like legs to support our in increased weight. Um, whereas on a planet with a weak, if we could have set up a colony on the moon, then you, we'd probably evolve towards being like little spidery things skittering around on, on long spindly legs, um, provided that survival uh, was non-random, provided it was was possible to, to die uh, before you reach reproductive age, which in our civilization is quite difficult to do. Um, so there are all sorts of unknowns, all sorts of strangenesses 
which have been brought about by the uniqueness of, of humans. I think it's time for two more questions, if anyone. Perhaps we could open up to a broader range of topics if you wanted. Anybody else want to speak? Um, hello, I've got a question from my boss, Dr. Alan Bond. Um, he wrote you an email that never got replied to, <laughs> which I'm about to read to you now. Um, my apologies sorry, first for that. that. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a long one. <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's only one page. <laughs> Dear Dr. Dawkins, I am and have been since a small child atheist and not even slightly agnostic and very close to the extreme limit on your non-believers scale. I do not normally feel the urge to discuss this as I have better things to deliberate, but in the context of a fundamental scientific error in the God delusion, which I was given as a gift, I feel it necessary to get it out of the way to begin with so you know where I stand. Your discussion of complexity growing from lesser complexity is incorrect. The entropy of an evolving biological system increases when all thermodynamic processes are taken into account and the entropy, i.e. the disorder, of the universe as a whole increases. The local reduction in entropy is only local. The universe, it seems, began in a very low entropy, i.e. highly ordered state, and with a set of rules, the laws of physics, which I don't want to debate in this note, which eventually led this highly ordered state to create the organized molecular structures of biology and other things. Your much vaunted evolution argument is a consequence of that initial organization and is little more than transformation of one ordered system into another. What you provide is mechanism, not the underlying thermodynamic cause. Now, if any of your opponents have the wit, they will say, if this isn't God creating man in his own image, what is? The initial state of the universe could just as easily satisfy the de definition of, the God, of God the creator as it could any other argument, Big Bang, uh, arose by any other name, etc. And this low entropy beginning represents a serious starting problem in astrophysics. In addition, I myself cannot disprove the possibility that the overall activity of the universe is not the processing of information on a level that I cannot see any more than a single brain cell can see the information being handled by the whole structure. The, def the discovery of quantum entanglement complicates this still further, contradicting the locality of interactions, which is what the theory was supposed to be about. I present this to you first to correct what is a serious error which would under, could undermine your arguments, but also to act as a devil's advocate on communication with God, since I feel your opponents generally lack the scientific knowledge to take you on. If, if atheists are to take a point of view on, on the world, they should be based on sounder foundations than those views that they tried to topple. The morality arguments are sterile, and I will not embark on those. Best regards, Alan Bond. <laughs> Well, I, 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 I wasn't really sure what the thrust of that was. I mean, the, um, and don't read it out again, please. Um, I am not a physicist. The room is filled with physicists. Um, the, if, if there was a suggestion there that uh, evolution um, violates the second law of thermodynamics, that, that's just plain wrong. Um, uh, and I hope that's obvious to everyone in the room. Um, uh, as Eddington said, um, if, if your pet theory, um, how, how did it go? If your, if your pet theory goes against Maxwell's equations, then so much the worse for Maxwell's equations. If your pet theory goes against observed fact, well, these experimentalists do bungle things sometimes. <laughs> But if your pet theory goes against the second law of thermodynamics, I can offer you no hope. There is nothing for it but to collapse in deepest humiliation. Um, so certainly evolution doesn't go against the second law of thermodynamics. Nothing else does. Um, I am not physicist enough to talk about uh, the origin of the cosmos. That I would have to leave to probably just about everybody in this room better than, than, than me. Um, and so I'm sorry to end on a rather unsatisfactory note, but, I, but I, I've been asked a question about physics rather than about biology. Uh, and as far, as far as biology is concerned, it's absolutely clear what's going on um, with no violation of any thermodynamic laws. 
complexity is increasing, but it's increasing locally um, at the expense of the rest of the universe. Okay, thank you for that. Um, in a moment, I'm going to ask Professor Dawkins just to tell, tell us in one or two minutes about the work of the RDFRS. Um, we're making a collection for his foundation, um, retiring collection. So um, please fold your donations neatly in half and put them in the bucket. I didn't and, know uh, that was going to happen, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, um, so uh, uh, could you just tell well, us I, a li I, little bit about its work, please? Well, I, I, I'm slightly embarrassed. I, I, I'm, I'm very grateful. I didn't know that was, that was, that was uh, in the cards. Um, the, the, uh, the, the, the foundation is for reason and science, um, and it, it's interested in, in education, obviously, in promoting science, in promoting reason, in promoting uh, skepticism. Um, it has two branches, one in America, which is doing rather a lot of things, and one in Britain. Um, perhaps I could just tell you about the most recent thing the British one has done, um, which is to um, commission an Ipsos Mori poll taken in the week after the 2011 census to try to find out what people who tick the Christian box in the census really believe. And the reason for this was that after the 2001 census, 72% of the British population ticked the Christian box. And this 72% was used by politicians and apologists to justify uh, the imposition of Christian values, such as bishops in the House of Lords, such as faith schools, and so on. Um, and a lot of us were rather skeptical of that figure of 72%, because we believed that uh, a lot of people would simply tick the Christian box because they were brought up Christian, or they were baptized, or um, they just feel that, I feel like a good person, and so I might as well tick, tick Christian, or I'm <coughs> certainly not a Muslim, so I might as well tick the Christian box. Um, so what we wanted to do was, first of all, to try to get the census authorities not to in include the Christian uh, question in the census, and we failed on that. They went ahead and put in a question, I, w w what is your religion, or do you have a religion, what is it? Um, so we fell back on plan B, which was to run a poll, a large poll, professionally conducted, um, which is quite expensive, uh, in the, in the very week after the census to ask people who tick the Christian box what they really believe. And we found some pretty remarkable things. First of all, the number who do tick the Christian box has dropped from 72% to 54%, which is an embarrassment to the lobbyists who want to use that figure. Second, if you just take the 54% and ask them supplementary questions like, how often do you go to church? Um, can you pick out which is the first book of the New Testament? given a choice of Matthew, Genesis, Acts of the Apostles, or Psalms, less than 40% of the people who tick the Christian box are sufficiently familiar with the Bible to pick out Matthew. Um, and when you ask people, why, you, why did you tick the Christian box? The majority, the, the most favored answer was, because I think of myself as a good person, which is pretty shocking. Um, and the, especially when you go on to a supplementary question, which is um, when you are faced with a moral dilemma, like what, does, what would be right or wrong in, such a, in, a, in a situation, do you turn to your religion? Only 10% of the people who tick the Christian box answered yes to that. So that seems to contradict this view that you're, you're Christian because you feel like a, a good person. And there are lots and lots of other uh, questions, the, the general purport of which has been, I think, or, sh or will be, to undermine, to pull the rug out, really, from anybody who wishes to use the census as, ev as evidence that Britain is a, is a Christian country, and therefore Christian values and, um, and um, politics should follow. That's just the latest thing. It's in my mind at the moment because we've only published the results of this, of this survey last week. And there's been a t tremendous backlash against it in the press, which some of you may have seen. But that's just one thing that the foundation does. So um, we, we, we stand for reason and science and against superstition of all kinds. And, and that includes religion. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, I was going to ask people to show, give a round of applause, but you've all, all done it already. So, uh, th thank you all for attending, and um, uh, no, thank you, Professor. Thank Dawkins. you very much indeed. Thank you.